Amen, somebody. High five three people and tell them they're awesome for getting out in the snow. We ain't afraid of no snow. Ain't that right? We ain't afraid of no snow. <laughs> Amen, guys. I'm excited. We are continuing our... Se- Wait a minute. I'm excited because next week, y'all, we go to services here. Come on, somebody. Man, now here's what I need you to do. I know it's a snow day, and so pe- some of us, you know, some people are getting to watch online, and there's some some uh, um, roads that are real icy. But listen, next week, look at your neighbor. Say next week, I'm gonna bring somebody. I'm gonna ask till I get someone. Look, people quit saying it. They're like, nope, nope, not gonna promise. Nope, nope. <laughs> I'm not going to let my mouth lead me into sin. Come on, somebody. Um, Anyhow, we are continuing our series, Kingdom Come. Man, we had so much fun last week. Uh, God moved in such a great way. Um, We're seeing people saved every week. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. That's why we do it all, man. Amen. So this week we're talking uh, the kingdom of heaven is like, okay? So Jesus told a lot of parables, a lot of stories uh, with this thought in mind. The kingdom of heaven is like, and he goes on to tell. So let's go ahead and we'll just start uh, in Matthew chapter um, uh, 13, and we'll just read probably the first few verses, and then we'll, we'll jump around a little bit. Here's what it says. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. And then in his joy, he goes and sell all he has and buys the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search for fine pearls who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and he bought that pearl. And we're going to stop there and we'll come back to the, the, next, the, next aspect, uh, the next aspect of what the kingdom of heaven is like. But I think it's so cool that the very first two things that we're going to talk about today, uh, uh, the kingdom of heaven being like some stuff, I think it's so fascinating um, that he, he, he correlates it to being like a treasure, right? So, so when Jesus would talk about the kingdom of heaven or parables, um, he, he did that to, 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 to speak in, in relevant ways that the culture could understand, right? So Jesus would say, uh, he would talk about fishing. But he wasn't a fisherman. He would talk about farming, but he wasn't a farmer. He talked about shepherding, but he wasn't a shepherd. Why? I mean, he had garden and that stuff, but he did that because the entire culture understood what shepherding was. The entire culture understood, and if, and if they didn't, they should, what fishing is. Come on, somebody. Amen. Okay, that's the rest of y'all. We're praying for sanctification. Uh, uh, but they all knew what shepherding was, even if they didn't have sheep, right? So he's telling these parables to get them and us to understand what the kingdom of heaven can be like. So he starts it off with the kingdom of heaven is like these hidden treasures, right? Now, here's what's crazy. Both the guy in the field and the guy with the pearl, they found what they were looking for. Come on, somebody. They found what they were looking for. Matthew 6, uh, verse 33, it says, seek first the kingdom of God. To crave first God's dominion in your world. And in Matthew 7, 7, he says, seek the kingdom. And guess what? It's not, it's, come on, somebody. It's not, not rocket science. If you seek it, he says in Matthew 7, 7, you're going to find it. Like you're going to find the thing that you are anticipating from God. You are going to find the thing that your heart is searching out. So when God hides things, so it's talking about this hidden pearl and this hidden treasure. And here's the reality, guys. When God hides things, he hides them so you can find them. Right? So it's like like playing playing hide and go seek with uh, with my three-year-old Benny. Like, Like when I put hide and go seek, what do I do? Like, I lay on the couch, and I cover my face with the pillow. Anybody with a three-year-old, you know what I'm talking about. Or how about when they hide? That's even better. When they hide, and he does that, he puts his head in the pillow, and he'll say, Daddy, come find me. What do you do? Like, I'm stepping over that kid, like this right here. I'm like, Benny, where are you at, Benny? Benny, and he's just chuckling, you know, he's cackling, like little three-year-old voice, right? He's not hiding super well, and that's how it is with God. Like, when I'm playing with Benny, I don't hide in the crawl space. Come on, somebody, because he has no understanding. Well, he did sneak out the doggy door one time, but he has no understanding of how to get outside and into the crawl space, right? Like, this is beyond his realm of understanding. So the kingdom of God is like that. Right? It's hidden, but it's not hidden so you can't find it. It's hidden so it's easily found. 
So here's what the word says. The word says that it's the glory of kings to search out a matter, but it's the glory of God to conceal it, right? And so with us, with the kingdom of God, our role is to start looking, God, in my everyday life, where can your dominion show up? In my job, where can I have your dominion? In my life, in my marriage, in my family, in everything I do, oh God, where can your dominion, what's happening in heaven, happen on earth, where can I find it? It's readily available. But the key is what? You got to look for it, right? Like, like you have to be, 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 be anticipating in your everyday life finding it. It's the glory of, of kings to search a matter out. But it's the glory of God to conceal the matter. He's not hiding these things so we can't find them. He's hiding them so we can't. I was asking God uh, some questions on direction for the church. And he wasn't answering you guys ever deal with that? Look at you. No, he answers my prayer every time. You have little faith, oh, pastor. <laughs> like, I'm saying, God, I don't get it. Why aren't you answering me? And, and you spiritual people are like, oh, I will wait for thee in thine hiding place. For thou art. <laughs> right? Like, I get frustrated. Like, I'm going, God, I'm like doing, I'm fasting, I'm praying, I'm doing all this stuff, and I'm trying to hear from you, and you won't even talk to me, and I don't get it, and I'm trying, and then finally, I'm asking this question, should we do this, or this, or this, or this? God, what should we do? For like 18 months, God, this, or this, and finally, God spoke to me, and he said, he said, he said almost, he said, you're asking the wrong question. I said, okay, what's the right question? You know what he said? Nothing. So I started, I asked him another question. He goes, that's the right question. I said, okay, what's the answer? You know what he said? Nothing. <laughs> Why? Because it's my job. Come on, come on, church. It's my job to search it out. His job is to lead me and guide me and, uh, and, for, and to show me that everywhere I look, I have an opportunity to access the kingdom of heaven. My job is everywhere I go to be looking for that access. Everywhere I go to be saying, God, how can I be better as a pastor, better as a father, better as a, pa better as a, as a leader? God, how can, I've got to do all these things. And his job is to lead me. His job is to make it easy to find so I asked the right question, and guess what? Within just a week and a half, the answer came. But he didn't speak it to me. It came through me searching it out. Come on, somebody. Right? That's what's going on here. So, so here's my question. Look what it says. Go back to 40, either one of the 44, 45, 46, any of those. Uh, the kingdom of heaven is like a field covered up. There it is. And in his joy, he goes and sells all he has to buy the field. Total game changer. So this guy is in this field. He's in someone's field. He's trespassing. We don't know, <laughs> right? I'm not condoning this, okay? But if you do, I was in a, um, a place the other day in my Jeep, and it was muddy, and I felt like the Lord said, you should go in that mud. I said, spirit, lead me. <laughs> if you say go, I'll obey, amen? And we got it out. It was a blast. But anyhow, nevertheless, here's the reality, guys he's in this field and he finds this treasure and it's hidden in this field. And what does he do? He says, man, this treasure has so much value. I'm going to sell everything I own to buy that field. And notice it didn't say in his depression, he sold. It didn't say in his frustration to be obedient to God. It said it was his joy. Because he understood that what he was going to get was so much greater than what he was going to have to leave behind. Come on, somebody. He understood like what he was going to get to tap into. The access that he was going to have was so much greater than what he was going to let go of. It was so worth it. Here's the reality. The right value system changes your vision. Right? Both the guy with the pearl and the guy with the treasure, they understood just this little principle. They understood the value of the thing they desired. And they understood it was worth everything in the process. But here's where we are. We don't like to let go. So what happens is we're saying, we're saying, God, I want this, but I don't want to let go of this. What do I do? Because here's the reality. If we're going to operate in the fullness of the kingdom of God in our everyday life, it's going to cost you everything. But it's worth it, right? But what we do is we go, like we wake up in the morning and we're we gonna sprinkle a little Jesus on our day. Come on, somebody. Like we're like, listen, don't, don't convict me. 
Don't, don't change. Like, don't make me do anything awkward. I'm just going to add a little Jesus, and hopefully it works out. I've been trying to eat cleaner. My wife's been telling me I've been eating bad for a while, so I'm trying to eat cleaner. And here's the thing. I got this protein powder that i got to eat, and it replaces a meal, okay? But you know what I did to make it taste better? I added chocolate milk. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, that's not in the diet. But man, it tasted so much better. But here's the reality. If I'm going to add my chocolate milk, Jesus, take the wheel. It was good, too. For the first time I had that powder, I thought, wow, that was really good. <laughs> Most of the time, I'm like, I can drink it, and that's it. It was so good, y'all. But here's the reality. If I'm going to continue to add chocolate milk to this protein powder, how many of y'all know it's voiding out the per it's voiding out the purpose of the protein powder. And if I'm adding the fat, I'm not going to get the desired results. And I sure can't blame the manufacturer. Am I preaching to somebody? I can't then blame the manufacturer and saying, well, it's not doing what it's supposed to do. And he says, well, you're putting water in it. And I said, no, I put chocolate milk. He's going to go, you're an idiot. This is what we do with God. We say, I just want to sprinkle a little blessing on my life. But don't make me change anything about my life. I want to sprinkle a little Jesus in my marriage, but I really don't want to treat my spouse any different. Ain't nobody shout on that one. <laughs> right? But that's not the way it works. Both these guys understood there was a treasure, and they had access to the treasure, but they're going to have to change their mindset. They were going to have to revalue their vision. They were going to have to change the way they thought. They were going to have to change the way they thought about what they were and what, ha or what they had. And for us, we get into this tug of war of not wanting to let go of what we have, but wanting everything God has. And at some point, you got to let go because the kingdom of God is not about being in control. It's letting go of control. You can clap. Amen. It's true. Now, that's good preaching. I'm praying that I'll follow that. Because <laughs> it's tough. Because that's what we all struggle with. We struggle with this fear of saying, okay, I'm going to let go, God, but I don't know what's going to happen. And what do we do? We grab, the minute it doesn't look the way we want it to look, we grab back a hold of the wheel. And we, you guys ever seen those Teslas that drive themselves? I'm like Will Smith and I, robot. I don't trust that stuff. I was riding with a guy, and he was like, he called it, his, well, I don't know what to call it. Anyway, I'm riding with this guy, and he lets go of the wheel, and we're looking in the back seat. He's like, look how much room is back. And then I realized we're four miles down the road and he ain't touched the steering wheel. I started praying in tongues. Come on, <laughs> I was like, God in heaven, what are you doing? You're going to kill us all. He's like, no, it drives itself. And I'm like, I don't want it to drive itself. <laughs> if you don't want to drive, let me drive. I don't trust the robot. Amen? And that's how, but, but really the Holy Spirit's like the robot, right? And he's going to lead us, and he knows the destination, and he can get us there safe, and there's not a deer that's going to cross our path or an obstacle that he can't navigate us around, but we want to be in control. And then we get in a wreck, and then we say, God, why'd you let that happen? And he said, because you took the wheel. Right? We don't want to let go, and so these two guys understood the kingdom of heaven isn't about me gaining control. It's me losing control, letting go of it. It's about me trusting, understanding that it will cost them everything. So in their joy, they sold all they had. They revalued their vision. It wasn't about what they had. It's about what they had access to. Come on, somebody. And that's the way it is. Like, I studied when I was young, uh, when I was in college, both weeks. Uh, <laughs> I did finally finish college kids, amen. But when I was going to school, like, opening week, I fell down the stairs to the dorm, and I thought, this isn't good for me, amen. Uh, I got stitches at one point playing basketball. It was a mess. Anyhow, um, like, I'd, I'd get ready to take a test, and I'd study for the test, and I'd say, now, God, bring back the things I studied, amen. I got to put something in me for him to draw out, amen, somebody, okay. That's kingdom. Right? That's the kingdom, right? It wasn't about what we have, but it's about what we have access to. And I remember when this thought changed everything about my life. Let's look at what verse 47 says. I'm super excited about verse 47. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered every kind of fish. And when it was full, the men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted into good, sort of the good in containers. And they, but they threw the bad away. That sounds logical. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth, right? So what's it talking about? It's not talking about good people versus bad people because here's the reality. You can't do enough good for God. It's talking about not good people versus bad people. It's talking about people that are covered by the blood and those not covered by the... Am I preaching? Come on, somebody. 
That's what it's talking about. It's not talking about good fish, bad fish, red fish, blue fish. Come on, Dr. Seuss. Like, that's it, not one fish, two. It ain't talking about that. It's, the question isn't, man, this is a, like, God's not looking down going, well, that's a good fish, and that one's a trashy fish. He's looking down, and all he can see is the blood, or not, the, am I preaching? All he can see is, are you covered, or are you not covered? Because you can't do enough good for him to love you, and you can't do enough bad for his love to quit. He loves you because you're born. That's, that's the kingdom, and that's the principle that he's showing. So the question is, if it's not about the reality of good and bad, then who gets to inherit the kingdom? Let's look, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and if they have it, they'll throw it up there. If not, I'll read it either way. He says this, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor the idolater, the idolater church, is anybody that puts anything before God. It's some of the people that sprinkle a little Jesus on their life. Nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. As such were some of you. You used to be that way. But you were washed. You were, come on, oh, come on, church. You were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. Now, it lists some stuff. It lists some stuff. So what we do is we start going, okay. Let's see, I don't do that. I don't do that. And God's going, here's the reality. Again, it's not saying that just these things. It's saying anybody that's unrighteous, and here are some examples. Unrighteous simply is not in right standing with God. That's literally what unrighteous means, as some of you were. I don't like it when people say, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. I'm not a sinner anymore. Because sinners don't get to inherit the kingdom of God. I'm saved covered by the blood. I don't get to be covered and come out. And get, you know what I mean? Like, like the simplicity of the gospel is just this. You, you are no longer, if you are in Christ, you are no longer a sinner. Does it mean all of a sudden that you don't have sin issues? No, because you still might. You still might. 100%. You may still have issues and inclinations, right? But here's the reality. Being saved doesn't make you perfect. It makes you covered. He's not, he's not saying good fish, bad fish, red fish, boo. He's not saying are you good fish or bad fish. He's saying are you caught by the fishermen? Come on, somebody. That's the question. Like that is the simplicity of the kingdom of God. Now here's where we struggle because we all have issues that come very natural in our life. I have people that say, well, I was born this way. I was born that way. I was born to want to punch people that irritate me right in the face. <laughs> Anybody else born that way? Some of us think about the same person. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Now, here's the reality. John 3, 3. You must be born again. Like, that's the reality. Because what happens is we say, well, I'm born like this, and I can't help it. And, and you know what? I, I was born with my own sin issues. That's true. We all were. That's why Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born of water and spirit. You must be born again. That's the simplicity of the gospel. Because see, what happens is we, we start to make excuses for our natural desires. You know what Luke 14 says? It says, unless, you, unless if you hate your mom and dad, you don't get to inherit the kingdom of heaven. Now, I struggle with this because Tim and Sharice Norman are pretty good people. I like them. And I'm reading that in Luke 14. I'm like, wait a minute, God. If i got to hate my parents, like, how do I manufacture hate for someone I love? I, I'm struggling with this. And, and I know that, and I know, church, that we all have propensity to things that aren't of God. But I'm looking at this going, God, I'm struggling because I, you know, I love them. I don't hate them. And I'm wrestling with this. And, and, and I thought, I have to study this out to see really what was God talking about. And you know what it means in Luke 14 when he says, unless you hate your mom and dad? He's, it literally means you are going to have natural desires that feel very normal. But they go against the heart of God, and you have to tell yourself no. I'm like, so I don't get to punch him? I asked a high patrolman. He goes to Nevada, but he was in Stockton last week, and I was talking to him about a situation. He goes, yeah, you just can't punch him. I was like, well, I wasn't going to, but I just want to make sure I don't, you know, nothing. We don't get in trouble. And he said, no, no, you can do that. You just can't, you can't punch him right in the face. And I was like, but if they need it. We all have these natural desires. In our, in our flesh that feel very normal. That's why Paul said, I beat myself black and blue. Because I have this natural de desire to do something, but when I read your word, I read where that's opposite the heart of God. So then I have to make a decision. Am I going to choose what God says or what I feel? Welcome to the kingdom of heaven. Here's the reality. Salvation, it, 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 again, it's not about being perfect. It's about being covered. It's about being caught. 
Salvation, literally, guys, is not about being perfect, but it's understanding that you are covered and you now have access to no longer be bound by things in your life. That's literally what it means. It means I have a natural desire to, to this thing or to that thing, and, and you do too. We all have these very normal, natural desires. But being saved means I have access. I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm talking WWE, come on somebody, in a tag team wrestling match. And I'm getting my tail whooped, and I reach over, and I, I, hi, and I slap Hulk Hogan. Come on, brother. And, and he comes into the ring, and he defeats the adversary for me. That's what being saved is about. It's not saying I can whip everything by myself. It's saying... I have access, Romans chapter 8 in the message version, says you no longer live under a low-lying black cloud. You no longer live in condemnation. You no longer live being beat up by everything that used to torment you. It says this in the message, there is a new power in operation. Somebody, buddy, shout glory. That's the gospel. That's the kingdom, y'all. That's the kingdom simplified. It's understanding that I can't do it, but he already has. And he, I high five him, and he gives me access to be bound by something, to be freed by something. Check this out that I've even yet to be bound by. Whoa. Someone that got that's going to be thankful for it. Used to be there was a one way, and I had to get through that thing. Now he's going, Burr, put it in reverse, rerouting. <laughs> Go this way. Because there's a snare that way. And it's not my heart for you to be ensnared, it's my heart for you to be freed. That's the kingdom. So who gets to inherit the kingdom of heaven? Not the unrighteous. 100%. Those that are not in right standing with God. What makes you in right standing with God? Jesus. Jesus. What if I'm a good person? You'll go to hell. Whew, that's tough. You'll go to hell. What if I'm a bad person? You'll go to hell. What if I'm covered but I struggle with bad things? You'll go to heaven. gospel that's the gospel of the kingdom not good fish bad fish right but if you're covered if you're caught there's a secret menu guys that we've talked about a lot over the last few years the secret menu but we have to be looking for that secret menu and then we can't blame the chef if the food ain't good come on somebody we gotta say well I should have ordered off the secret menu when I'm frustrated I don't get to blame God and say well, I'm frustrated with this oh, it's your fault no no I have a secret menu and just because it didn't say I could add cheese doesn't mean I can't add cheese. Can I tell you, cheese make almost anything better? My God. They're like, do you want extra cheese? Uh, yes. Why is that an option? Just the answer is yet. Yeah. Or bacon? My God, come on, somebody. Listen, if there's no other, if, if you have no other reason to be thankful for grace and a new covenant, it's bacon. <laughs> They are shouting me down and behind me. Now, here's the reality, guys. Back to the treasure and the pearl, trying to bring this all together. Why did others walk by a field that a great treasure laid? Why did over others overlook a pearl that could change their life? To see value, the kind of value that God has, you have to be looking through his mindset and through his eyes. Right? Because real value isn't what you see with your eyes open. It's what you see with your eyes closed. Real vision. God vision isn't what you see with your eyes at all. It's what you see with your heart. Right? So if I'm going to value things the way God values them, I have to understand this. Otherwise, in my life, in my marriage, in my parenting, in my job, in my church, it will always be all about me. And here's the reality. That is anti-kingdom. That's anti-kingdom. Pastor Megan always says, God's will does not revolve around you, but it involves you. You have a part to play, but it's not all about your opinion and what you want. Matter of fact, he often doesn't ask my opinion. Sometimes he does, and I like those times. <laughs> Other times he goes, no, this is what will bring success. Luke 17, this is being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come. They're saying, God, Jesus, when's it going to come? And he responds in verse 21 simply, it's not going to come with all these signs and all this stuff. For behold, the kingdom of God is already in your midst. He says, you're not, look, look we are not looking. For, now, we are, we are looking for Jesus to split the sky and come again. We're looking for that. I can't wait. Well, I heard it one time, I'm going to fly, not die. Come on, somebody. I'm looking for it. But as far as the king's dominion, I'm living in it. 
this guy, this guy, I uh, heard this story. It's like 1860s or 80s or something like that. This guy had a little farm, meager, meager existence, little ox, little, little plow, little cabin. And it was good. He had this, had it. He was plowing the field. The field was rocky. He was from Cedar County, Polk County. Come on, somebody. He's from Southwest Missouri. Y'all know it. Picking rock every day, frustrated. I don't know if he was cursing maybe when he threw the rocks. So angry with all the obstacles. Tired of barely getting by. This traveling salesman comes through. The tra not salesman, this traveler comes through. And, and he stayed with them. And, and they start having this conversation. And, and the traveler says, well, how's your farm? And the farmer says, man, it's awful. I don't like my farm at all. I'm so tired. I'm exhausted. I pick rock. I barely, I'm barely making enough to pay my bills. My kids don't have the things out. I'm just so tired. And the, the, the traveler says, oh, man, have you heard about India? He said, yeah, it's been around for a while. He goes, no, 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 there's diamonds, huge, beautiful diamonds in India. Between these two mountains, there's a river that flows and people are walking up, putting their hand in the stream and pulling out beautiful diamonds. Literally, they're saying, literally, it's incredible what God is doing. It's incredible, not what God's doing, it's incredible the diamonds that they're finding. It's amazing, you should go. So the guy thought about it. Over a little bit of time passed, you know what he did? He sold everything he had, JR. And left his family, his kids, and said, you guys wait in this cottage, this little apartment in town. I think he lived in South Africa. And he said, I'm going in search for diamonds. Looked all over India, Africa. Ended up in, I think it was Barcelona, Spain, on a bridge with a raging river underneath him. Never found diamonds. He pinned a letter. And it literally said, there are no diamonds anywhere. Laid the letter on the bridge and jumped off the bridge and took his own life. That's not the end of the story. The guy that bought his farm, same farm, same plow, same ox, same little cabin, same field, started plowing. And again, tons of rocks. And he's piling the rocks. And he found one one day. Actually, it's kind of a funny story. He found this rock that was real pretty. And he said when the sun would hit it, like it looked like a rainbow on the inside of this big black rock. So he took it. He, he was, you know, put it on his mantle. He wasn't real good at decorating. And he put this big old rock on his mantle and just said, well, now I have some decoration. And one day the local priest stopped by. Talk about church and what's going on in the city. And the priest is talking with him. And the priest in the off in the distance, he sees that rock on the mantle. He says, where'd you find that? That's beautiful. He said, man, they're all over my field. He goes, you know what that is? He said, no. He said, I, I, before I was a priest in ministry, I was a jeweler and that is a diamond in the rough. And I begin to think how many of us have provision laying on our mantle when it's supposed to be used. Come on, somebody. How many of us have some diamonds in the rough in our life and they have purpose and they have value. We just haven't yet searched to the bottom of them. We haven't yet chiseled out the, 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 the value that God has in it. And the, the priest said, wait a minute. You've got these all over your farm. He said, all over my farm. Sure enough, every, every one of those big black rocks were diamonds. It was it became the largest diamond mine in the history of the world. That one rock in 18, whatever it was, 50, 60, 70, sold for $25,000. I can't tell you how many millions that is today. Literally, the Queen of England began to get all her, all her diamonds for her crown from this mine in South Africa. This guy is walking by a field. And he sees value in something in the field that someone else overlooked. This guy's searching for fine pearls and he finds this pearl in a market that someone else just threw in with the others. And God says the kingdom of heaven is like this. There's value in the kingdom of heaven if you're willing to search it out. There's value in the kingdom of God. And I'm telling you, it'll bring hope. It'll bring peace. It'll bring joy. It'll bring provision. But often it will come in the rough. And it's the, it's the joy or the glory of kings to dig it out. But it's the glory of God to conceal the matter. Am I preaching to anybody? I wonder how many of us, God is doing stuff in our life. And he's planted some stuff in the field of our heart, in the soil of our life, in our heart. Ideas and vision and dreams and all the while we're saying if I was here if I was 
there if I was married to that person or this person and the whole time God is saying no 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 the miracle is beneath the soil keep digging keep digging I know it's exhausting keep digging I know you're tired keep digging I know it's a dirty job keep digging because as you dig you find provision as you dig you find purpose as you dig church we find promise as we dig we find the kingdom of God yes would you get on your feet right now as we sing can we declare I'm no longer gonna look in other fields the kingdom of God is here joy is available peace is available hope is available provision is available ideas are available God I'm revaluing my vision to see what you see in every area of my life in Jesus name I pray if you say it's wrong if you say release, I'm letting go. If you're in it with me, I'll be When you say to jump, I'm diving in. If you say to still, then I will be. If you say to trust, I will obey. Teach me how to follow your way. Don't chase and feelings. If you're here this morning and the kingdom that he's been talking about, being able to be washed by that blood, being able to uh, walk in the favor of the kingdom of God, being able to see what that's like in your life. Maybe you've never made the choice to follow him before. Maybe you've never searched for him in a way that He's become real in your life. This morning, I believe that on a snowy, icy day, that as we seek Him, we will find Him. So this morning, nobody looking around, if that's you this morning and you want to accept Jesus into your life as a personal Lord and Savior, would you lift your hand? Anybody in the room? Anywhere? Next, maybe, maybe you've been sitting on, on a field of diamonds and, and you've, you've, you've lost your, your ability or your desire to keep seeking and searching and finding what God has for you. And maybe, maybe your life it just feels like it's kind of mixed up and turned upside down. And, and, and today you've realized that, that God has given you things if you would just seek after him, if you would just search after him, if you would just run towards what the Holy Spirit says and quit shying away and this morning you want to just declare that we're not running away but we're running to what God wants if that's you this morning would you just lift your hands just to say God I, I'm ready to chase after you like never before God I want you real in my life 